I'm Quincy Larson, teacher and founder of Free Code Camp. Each week, we're talking to developers, entrepreneurs, and ambitious people who are getting into tech. And today, we are thrilled to welcome Per Borgen. Great to be here. Yeah, and, and uh, we are so excited to have you here. Of course, Per is the founder of Scrimba. He is a software engineer turned tech founder. Uh, who's gone through like Y Combinator, runs a very popular website uh, that teaches coding. We've published many of those courses on the Free Code Camp YouTube channel. And I'm just thrilled to sit down and talk with you because we've never had you on the on the podcast yet after more than 100 episodes. So it feels Super like a bit of an omission. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, just note that I'm recovering from like a pretty serious cough. That had me like completely debilitated for like a week. So if I have a coughing fit or anything, uh, just know that I'm fine. I'm just echoes of my previous illness. But um, Per, where where you are? Are you, are you over in Oslo right now? Yes, we are based uh, here out of Oslo, where uh, the founding team is from, and where uh, yeah we all live. Awesome. Well, I'm very interested as an American uh, in you know I'm I'm from. Scandinavia originally my family came over from Sweden which I know is different for Norway but uh I'm I'm always very interested in in that kind of region you know the land of vikings and uh <laughs> I I know that Norway is a very small country but it's a it's a very influential country on the world stage and it has a ton of natural beauty so I have to ask what was it like growing up in Norway so uh I'm from the capital uh, Oslo uh, from the city so to be honest, I don't. I I never really went to the the most beautiful places uh, until I was uh, an adult, or not 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 much at least. But uh, of course, it, it it's it's a great place to live. Uh, good uh, good good system, uh, welfare system, uh, but, but with freedom as well, and with uh, skiing and nature and yeah, great place. You should you should yep. come and visit us. Awesome. Uh, it's definitely on my bucket list of places to visit. Uh, so how would you compare like the Norwegian tech scene uh, with San Francisco and Silicon Valley, where I know you've spent quite a bit of time over these past few years? Yeah, so it's um, much smaller, of course, and it's, uh, it's quite... Um... It's less ambitious, I would say, or at least when I started out uh, as a founder and like 10 years ago or so, uh, there was a lot fewer startups. And every time we, uh, I've gone to San Francisco, I've been, been, been coming back super pumped and, and twice as ambitious, uh, which is a, sometimes a good thing. Other, other t um, uh, at other times, it's, uh, you want to be a bit more frugal and care about the fundamentals and, and the next step and not the big dream. So uh, I think we've kind of, with Scrimbot, tried to strike a, a balance between being inspired a little bit by the the American ambition and and also uh, by by the like uh, down to earth uh, uh, way of running companies in Norway. But it is changing. It, it's becoming more and more uh, international startups out of Scandinavia or out of Norway. Sweden has had many uh, over the last decades, but but Norway's been lagging a little bit behind. But it it's it's getting better. Yeah, yeah. Well, Norway, of course, is a, like an economic powerhouse. Like per capita GDP, I think, is maybe the highest in the world. Uh, and a lot of that is because you all have all this abundant mineral wealth. Did, uh, did you hear about like the discovery of the massive phosphate reserves and some of these other rare earth minerals? Uh, I think it was maybe off the coast no. of Norway. <laughs> So, so I have this thing right now where I actually don't read the news. It's kind of my, my New Year's commitment where I try to stay away from the news because it just kills my productivity. So I've heard a little bit about it, but to be honest, you probably know more about it than, than I do. Okay, cool. Well, that, that's <laughs> interesting. So you completely cut the news out of your day to day. Is that like a New Year's resolution? Uh, yes, that was what I meant. Yeah, resolution, that's the word. It is. Uh, so, because I just find that it's such a struggle to to stay productive with all the the temptations out there, uh, and and news and social media being the like the, the the most important ones, gotta gotta kind of make some rules for myself in order to stay away from it. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. Uh, like, I have kind of like tuned out a lot of the election related <laughs> news here in the United yeah. States because I already know how I'm voting, so it's not going to change anything. So uh, why spend a whole lot of time like 
going over the the gory details of the you know democratic process um i i realize that that may sound like a very privileged take but um <laughs> Course, I, I've got a lot of stuff to do, and I can't be following the every uh, the every unfolding of all these different uh, you know dramas that are that are going on. I can just read about it in Wikipedia a few years from now and figure out what the conclusion was without having to go along for the entire ride. So yeah, or like uh, watch the evening news or something if a couple of times a week. That's more. That's what people did ba back in the good old days, or <laughs> good old uh, did like twenty years ago. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that worked to back, totally back in fine. The pre we don't pre-social media days <laughs> yes yeah. yeah so i'm very interested in delving into your background because you have a pretty unique background uh, among tech founders and developers so you actually studied economics in college but then you went and you worked as a software developer for like five years maybe you can talk about how you got into coding and how you were able to get those those first few jobs as a developer. Maybe you can just kind of give us like an origin story, if you will. Yeah, so, so I didn't work as a software developer for five years, uh, actually. It, sh it was shorter than that. It was like uh, uh, between on, one and two years after I, I oh, graduated okay. from the boot camp. And then um, I've been coding at Scrimba uh, for like the last seven years uh, here and there, of course. Okay. But, but so, now, now so very little. So you did little. go to a boot camp then? Yeah, or it was a free peer-to-peer -peer driven boot camp in London. So it was like no teachers and uh, just a bunch of people thrown together uh, who who um, got a task every week. Like this week, you're going to build a blog or an e-commerce site or whatever. And it was our responsibility to learn from each other and help each other and kind of uh, together build that, that weekly product. It's called yeah, that Founders sounds like and a Coders. Really cool kind of, what, what was it? Founders and Coders. Like, yeah, I've Fa heard of Founders that. and Coders, yeah. Yeah, and, and that always like struck me because it's, it's free and it's it's kind of peer-to-peer -peer base is very different from the conventional coding bootcamp models that we had like in San Francisco, for example. Um, exactly. Yeah, so, and so you hung out there with a bunch of other ambitious people who were trying to learn coding and essentially you kind of like self-taught in tandem. Yeah. Um, I did that and that was kind of coming off the back of uh, running a startup that failed. Uh, with with the same co-founder that I started Scrimba with uh, a bit later, but we 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 tried to build like kids apps uh, on iPhone and iPad and, and books and old fairy tales and stuff like that. We we did kids entertainment essentially. Um, Th that failed, um, and I felt really almost, at the time, almost a bit stupid for not knowing how to code. I felt like, what am I doing in this uh, the tech industry and working with products if I really don't know how to like uh, build uh, anything or debug anything or fix anything? So I re just had a, a strong urge to, to learn to code. And that's, so then I went uh, uh, to Founders and Coders. It was fantastic. And got a job at a startup when I came back to Oslo, uh, and worked there for uh, a little over a year. Uh, and then Sindra and I kind of uh, got the band back together and 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 did another uh, startup attempt, which is when uh, went better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that that's a really cool. So it's kind of like your your um, I guess imposter syndrome as a founder who couldn't code compelled yeah. you to like shore that up so that you can code. And of course now you code all the time and uh, you've built out this skill set, this developer mindset and actual kind of hands-on understanding of implementation details of apps to the point that you've even taught courses and things like that. So uh, yeah, that's really cool. Maybe you can talk about your co-founder a little bit. Like how did you, how did you two meet? Yeah. So we met at um co-working space uh, in Oslo uh, when the, the startup scene in Oslo was very small. So it was a kind of the, almost the only co-working space for founders in Oslo at the time. And he was um, he was working on his own project. I was working with the kids' books, and we kind of realized that the, his skill set and, um, and and the business, uh, we, me and we had a third co-founder co that we had built at the time was very, like, uh, complementary. So we kind of got together and, and started that company. And what's interesting is that He's he's a brilliant engineer, like the best engineer I've worked with, and uh, he actually after uh, the first company failed, he went off and um, worked on his own self-made programming language and started consulting with his own self-made programming language, 
which is like a terrible idea for the people he consults for because he was the only person who knew how to, to write code in that language. So he, he then needed to um, create documentation for that uh, and started realizing that writing documentation is really boring. So he started recording videos for, to teach people about this language, which is called Imba. Uh, but just realizing or just trying to record videos, he realized what a bad process it is for both the teachers and the students to record uh, coding tutorials. Because as a teacher, you have to like be really careful about setting up your system correctly, about editing the video, about making sure everything is polished, about not talking yourself into a corner. And there's tons of like uh, adjacent skill sets you need in addition to being like good at explaining things. And uh, once you've done all of that and spent like an hour creating like 10 minutes of, of, of a polished tutorial, it ends up as a video which isn't interactive for the student either. So it's it's kind of taken all the data and reduced it to dead pixels, all the metadata. So it's a bad experience for the student and for the teacher. And that's what, yeah. what made him like, hmm, maybe we can make a coding tutorials, in, like video-based coding tutorials in a better way and kind of rethink it from first principles. And he did that and kind of invented the prototype for, for Scrimba, which eventually then became, yeah, the, the company we are today. Yeah, yeah, and I I remember very early days like the I was just floored by this technology because, I mean, at a fundamental level, it wasn't anything technologically, uh, you know, fancy. It was just like what you said, revisiting video from first principles and saying like, hey, why don't we, you know, sync up like this HTML with this audio, essentially. Exactly. And and it, for anybody out there who hasn't used Scrimba, you should go to Scrimba and use it. And just get a feel for how you press play, sound starts playing, you know, slides can pop up and you can pause it at any point and, and the actual DOM is being manipulated so that the code in the code editor, editor is editable and you can just click play and it'll just keep going, but you can pause it at any moment. It, it Code is like unique in this perspective that like you couldn't do this if you were like having like, uh, maybe, maybe you could do it with like a video game system, like where you like sync the video up. Uh, like like speed demo archive, like the old Quake demos. They were literally coordinate data for where the person was like bunny hopping over and shoot rocket jumping and stuff. And you could kind of pause it and you could you could like look around and stuff. That's basically like what you did for coding in the sense that coding is just text and it's it's not that heavy and you can just render it in the DOM where it lives. JavaScript is like the language of the web, right? So it, it's just like a web native. I, I almost consider scrimba more of a, dis a discovery than an invention yeah. <laughs> in the sense that <laughs> nobody had thought to do it that way yeah but that's like sindra uh my co-founder he's he's the kind of guy who who really when he sees something broken he just like gets an urge to, to fix it and and then turn or rebuild it uh based upon first principles and I think something you said there, which is like the uh, the weight of it, uh, is key because a scrim is essentially just some tiny, very, very uh, optimized pieces of data uh, that uh, kind of describe the changes that are happening in the DOM and makes it feel and look like a video. Uh, so, so, so kind of the bandwidth you need to watch a scrim compared to a video is like two orders of magnitude less which is part of the reason we've seen great success uh, uh, like all over the world in areas, especially where the, the internet access is slow. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I remember that was one of the big selling points of Scrimba early on is like, it's like 1% of a YouTube video in terms of yeah. bandwidth consumption. And a lot of that is because video you're, you're being very, uh, I guess, uh, imperative in the sense that you're telling every pixel what it's supposed to look like. And yes, there's like a compression algorithm and stuff like that. But for the most part, <laughs> you're literally tracking like billions of pieces of data for like a short video, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so it's inherently data intensive. Whereas yeah. audio is a tiny fraction, you know, especially if you're using like, a, like I think we use 96 kilobytes for our podcast, for example, 96 kilobit per second or something like that. That's tiny. That's like uh, half a megabyte per minute uh, video. I mean, once you add you and me on the screen and stuff, it's probably like closer to, I don't know, 10 megabits per uh, yeah. 10, 10 megabytes per minute or something like that, at least. 
uh, it just dramatically changes it. So that was one of the huge killer, uh, I guess, applications for Scrimba early on was a lot of folks don't live in San Francisco where they have gigabit internet and it's trivial for them to like watch 4K video on YouTube or whatever, right? A lot of people are, you know, putting money onto a phone card on like a data plan so that they can, you know, be able to text and, and maybe read some textual articles like Wikipedia or something and make some phone calls and stuff. And Scrimba is something that is kind of within their budget. Like even if you are on one of those kinds of plans where where you're paying and, and the data prices in some parts of the world are exorbitant, but that's, it is what they, it is what it is, right? Like you have to kind of adapt to that. And so Scrimba has represented like this huge windfall for people who don't have a lot of data. Yeah. And and just as, as a final thing, uh, which we haven't actually leaned into, but also which is very uh, real, is the, uh, the the computational power and the and the, um, the electricity that is used, like the the carbon footprint essentially of um, serving a scrim and sending it over the network uh, is also a lot less. I mean, it, I would assume those two um, graphs would scale like like the size uh, and, and, and the carbon footprint as well. So, but we yeah. haven't used that. We should probably have used that in our marketing a lot more, but <laughs> we, we haven't done that. But that, yeah. so, so many, so many, but I remember in the beginning, Sindra just explained all these benefits and the list goes on, uh, like with metadata and uh, uh, yeah, the, the bandwidth, the carbon footprint, so much. So it was kind of, even though I was a little bit scared for like jumping uh, on a new startup at the time, I remember that was kind of what convinced me when I realized that this is just like a fundamentally better way of doing it. And if we don't build it, someone else, I, I thought at least would eventually, as you said, discover yeah. this and build them themselves. But but uh, it is actually quite quite a lot of, difficult uh, technicalities in it like uh, making a, um, a prototype is perhaps not that hard but making it uh, polished and work well with the cursor and uh, responsiveness and all that is uh, and, and bundling and, and running the projects has, has shown to be quite a, a challenge uh, we've spent a lot of time and money uh, yeah making it work well yeah well i'm you know i'm kind of surprised that like a whole bunch of other companies didn't see this and immediately clone what you were doing uh but i'm not that surprised in the sense that like you think that like there's going to be this really intense competition when you have something that people want but like a lot of com big companies and stuff they're just distracted they got all these other things going on and uh yeah like they're going for like yeah. i guess more mass market like the audience for people learning the code is relatively small there are only about 30 million professional developers in the world i'd estimate that there are another 30 million or so people that are trying to actively learn to code. And um, that's not like Facebook or Instagram yeah. type total addressable markets, right? So I think a lot of and people just, it doesn't occur to them as like a niche that's worth going after, which is good, you know, for you and me, because we, we can serve those people without having to deal with like a whole lot of competition. Yeah, I, I think another thing there is uh, it's very hard for us to expand our catalog because we have to add support for every single thing we we, uh, we want to create a course on as opposed to a video-based platform where you can create courses on anything you can uh, yeah. because you just record a video of it. So so for that reason, it's kind of been hard for us actually to go more into the to the B2B and the enterprise market where they have re very wide requirements in terms of what kind of flippers and stuff like that. Yeah, so like we are, the, the niche and, is kind uh, of, yeah, yeah uh, protecting and, us a bit. Yeah. yeah, but to be fair, what you're offering is very different from what they're offering because, you know, to some extent, like video courses that have a teacher explaining a concept and maybe have some project that you code along home, you could argue that that's somewhat commoditized in the sense that anybody can sit down and create a really killer tutorial and publish it on YouTube and get an audience, right? So, but to actually build what you've built, which is <laughs> like very thoughtfully, deliberately designed, interactive pedagogy, that is very difficult. You need people that have thought a lot about that or who have like, you know, a lot of teaching experience and a lot of software development experience who can kind of figure out an optimal way to do that. And that's something like to talk about free cooking for a second. That's something we're very proud of is our core interactive curriculum. We, we use YouTube is kind of like um, a place where we can 
have videos on every topic, but when it comes to the core topics that we think every developer should learn, you know, the Git and the Linux and the SQL and the Python and the JavaScript, HTML, CSS, like we can really take time to build like a deliberate curriculum or that teaches those skills in an interactive way. And so I see in many ways what Scrimba is doing is like a different form of interactive than what Free Code Camp is doing, but it's incredibly valuable. Yeah, and I mean, Free Code Camp has been an inspiration for us uh, ever since we started giving out courses. So yeah, the, the admiration goes uh, both ways for sure. Yeah, and I, I should point out that that uh, you have personally taught some of the courses on the Free Code Camp YouTube channel, and yeah. uh, and some of your, you know, I think Bob Zirol. Yeah, is that his name? Yeah. Yes. Amazing teacher. <laughs> Like so many, so many great teachers coming out of the Scrimba camp that are um, hanging out and helping kind of essentially take the existing learning resources and port them to kind of like almost backward compatibility. You're backporting them to the old video format, yeah, but it's still yeah. cool to have them in video because that reaches a whole lot of people that are on YouTube. And then hopefully many of those people go and do the interactive versions of those courses on Scrimba. Yeah. Yeah. So... I have so much I want to talk to you about. I want to be mindful of your time, but uh, maybe you could just very quickly uh, tell us like, what are some of the, the main advantages of learning on Scrimba as opposed to watching like the video version of a Scrimba video? Yes. So uh, the key point is that uh, you are forced to get your hands on the code. Uh, uh, ha yeah. Hands on the keyboard, sorry. <laughs> um, and write code we kind of have this internal rule where if the student hasn't coded the concept or the learning objective in mind for the scrim, then we don't consider it to have been taught. We haven't like forced them to, to like, now you take over and do this challenge. And then I will come and show you the solution afterwards. I'm like, don't skip over it because the only one you're fooling by doing that is yourself. So it's kind of that, which is uh, the core benefit uh, most people um, um, talk about when they when they uh, try Scrimba and, and report back that they love. But also, as you said, we put a lot of content, like a lot of effort into our courses, into making them uh, not like most other courses out there. At least most other courses when we started out, uh, because we we never teach things just for the sake of of teaching the theory. It's always an underlying purpose for why we're teaching something. It's like it's like it's it's almost not like you're coming to us to learn JavaScript. It's like you're coming to us, and yes, the course is called Learn JavaScript. But once you're into the course, it's like, hey, how about how cool would it be to have this little blackjack game or this little app that actually solves a, a use case in your business for tracking sales leads in your Chrome extension. Like imagine building something like and having something like that. That would be valuable, right? Okay, what do we need to learn in order to do that? Well, we need a list of leads. How do we represent a list in programming? Well, that's now we got to learn about a race. So it's always that way, attacking it from the problem and then down to the yeah. what code you need to learn and never like, you're going to learn JavaScript. Here are the five main data types, uh, primitives and complex data types. Like, mm. so we're very, we're very like opinionated in, in that kind of way of teaching. And I think it it's not for everyone, but we have definitely found our kind of uh, yeah niche in, in the market of people who like to learn that way. Yeah, awesome. Well, one thing that uh, I'm very excited to talk with you about is the burgeoning field of AI engineering. Now, yeah. AI engineering, of course, my friend, uh, our, I guess our mutual friend, Sean Wang, recently had a big AI engineer summit uh, yeah. in San Francisco. Were you, were you there? No, uh, Froda, uh, our co-founder, third co-founder, he was there. Okay, cool. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't get to make it, but I did talk to him on a previous episode of the Free Code Camp podcast about AI engineering. but. You are teaching it, and yeah. you've made it a core focus of Scrimba. You know, you're a, a smaller company. You have limited resources in terms of what topics you can teach, and you decided this is what we're investing our scarce time, energy, teaching talent in, and you've created an AI engineering uh, curriculum. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what AI engineering is? Yeah, so... 
I think most people who hear uh, the phrase AI engineering uh, thinks it's more like an AI researcher or a machine learning researcher, meaning a, a person who uh, trains models and um, writes algorithms for, for, for AI models and uh, deploys the models and like stuff like that. Th that's not that at all. Uh, it's much, much easier than that. It's all, and it's much closer to a web developer role. It is all about taking the these um, AI APIs that are out there these days, or or, or you could host them your the open source versions yourself, but not like not train them uh, yourself and not write the algorithms for them yourself. It is about t being in that kind of top um, final layer or final UX layer where you take this amazing new technology and build next generation apps with it using like text, voice, images, uh, everything that has popped up over the last few years in generative AI. And it's like, it's just so exciting what you can do with it. And, and, and it's a feels like a, a green field out there where you can just pick new business areas uh, and, uh, and industries which haven't gotten AI properly applied right. um, or their AI hasn't been applied to it yet. And so, so we, we just see so many opportunities out there. And, and had I been a beginner and I, I today, I would have jumped on it immediately because uh, I think it's great for people's web developers careers these days. So, so that's why we're, we're, we're kind of going all in and we want to be the best place to learn that uh, because while it isn't that hard to learn, uh, actually, it is very overwhelming and easy to go into uh, kind of rab go down rabbit holes uh, and get confused and, and get paralysis by analysis and stuff like that. Yeah. So we're trying to yeah that, that's why we're we're going all in. Yeah. So maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, you said it's not that hard to learn, uh, but what to learn specifically and not yeah you know getting hacker news syndrome where you're just looking at like the latest release of whatever oh I need to learn this. You know, focusing on the core skills, the foundation upon which you can build out the rest of your skill set. Uh, maybe you could talk about what those core skills of an AI engineer is. And just to be completely clear, AI engineer is somebody, not necessarily a machine learning engineer, as you said, who's actually training models, but other skills to be able to essentially create like good output from AI or, or relevant yeah. out, output. I mean, that's how I would very naively describe it. Does, it, does that make sense? Uh, in, please feel free to extend yeah. that definition. No, no, it, it makes sense. I, but I would say not just create relevant output, but create uh, experiences from it. Because it, I think, I think it, it, one thing that was, was an epiphany for me was that chat GPT 3.5, uh, when like, uh, when chat GPT came and it was like GPT 3.5 and not 3.0, Yes, it was better than 3.0, but I think the actual true um, um, innovation there, or, or just as big of an innovation, was the the UX, the fact that you just chatted with it. I mean, if had you tried a, a GPT-3 in the playground uh, or, or a GPT-3-based product two months before uh, ChatGPT was launched, it... P or I at least got equally mind blown uh, when I when I saw that. So the technology take off the, 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 the yeah the user experience. Uh, yeah, absolutely. so so that's kind of, uh, being able to have a discussion and be able to drill yeah. deeper into it. Because I also like used like the various playgrounds from the previous versions of GPT, and I was like, this is cool, but this is not ready. I don't see how I could really use this beyond you know creating spam or something like that. But but once yeah. I really sat down, especially with GPT four. In in the, uh, but but you're right. ChatGPT was the key innovation, and OpenAI didn't see it as the key innovation. They were just like, oh, this is just some tech demo. Essentially, is is my understanding is kind of how they shipped it. But once they saw the usefulness in terms of being able to have conversations, it's great. I you know I use GPT I don't know ten fifteen times a day to to yeah. ask about various things. I use it all the time in language learning, for example. I have like full discussions with it in foreign languages and that's incredibly helpful. It's like having like a language tutor for free. Right? Uh so uh, but not to get too too deep into that, but I, I think what what you just said there that the chat interface and the ability to iterate on your initial prompt and to yeah. delve deeper and to branch and all that stuff, that, that was a huge revelation. Uh, for me personally, it sounds like it was for you as well. Yeah, it was. Uh, and 
Um, I think there's so many more discoveries in that application or UX la layer uh, to, to be found over the next few years. And, and very often uh, you also need, uh, in order to, to, to make, uh, to, to get a great experience, you also need the context of the product you're working in. So yeah, it works well to, to use ChatGPT uh, alongside when you're, for example, coding, but when you try Copilot uh, or, or, or any of these other uh, tools, uh, the coding tools that really put it in, put the AI in context for you, then you realize, oh, wow, th th this is much better. Uh, and I think that goes for all industries and professions uh, that will be uh, over the next few years um, heavily changed uh, as a consequence of this. So and what does that mean? Well, it means that there's a ton of work for developers to do in order to build these features and discover these features. And especially now that multimodality with voice is, is becoming more and more uh, streamlined as well. Yeah, just it's like being back in, in like... A, right after App Store was launched, I think. Yeah. Uh, and it's just like so many opportunities out there. Yeah. Now, one thing I'll push back on about the App Store is a lot of the best immediate applications that came out of the App Store were just folded back into iOS itself. For example, yeah. there was a time when you could publish a flashlight app and get millions of downloads and everybody would be like, oh, this is amazing. Because all you're really doing is using like the the API to like turn on the LED on the back of the thing, right? And you create a cool, you could have the coolest flashlight interface in the world, but if you open up your phone and uh, now you just swipe down and you can just hit the flashlight button and that's so much easier than trying to find a specific flashlight app and uh, yeah. going to the trouble of installing it and all that. Like, uh, and, and GPT is already kind of like, like uh, or I guess the GPT company, OpenAI, has already kind of like demonstrated that uh, a willingness to quickly like grab some of the most killer apps and like fold them into yeah. ChatGPT itself, for example. Like, do you think that uh, there's going to be like these obvious kind of applications that are going to get folded in? But then, if you look at the app store, obviously, plenty of apps have prospered. Uh, it's it's like a multi-billion-dollar-a-year ecosystem at this point. You you think similar like that GPT? specifically and and some of the other llms will have these big app ecosystems or are you thinking more like more like building enterprise apps on top of these or both yeah so i mean probably both things will happen like open ai will take a lot of the use cases and just fold it into chat gpt and that'll kill a lot of startups that most likely uh, they were already <laughs> trying to do it. it. Simultaneously, I think as well, like as I said, with, with the context being the product as well. For example, what I've used and I'm really impressed by is uh, Loom. If you've tried that um, mm -hmm. video service, yeah. where you easily create videos and uh, they've just integrated AI in such a useful and good way where it automatically ch creates chapters and summaries and edits and like so many things it does. And it, like ChatGPT or, or OpenAI couldn't have done that without building a full like Loom competitor, and they yeah, can't build true. competitors for all companies in the world. Uh, I think, and and I think it's that that'll just be a, a losing game. I think. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm very excited to see what happens with the ecosystem. Uh, I'm also excited to see what happens with open source models. Have you been following development of these open source foundational models? Yeah, so uh, I think it like was quite surprised at how quickly they kind of catched up to to ChatGPT. At least, it, I mean, it, it still is the gold standard with GPT four, but um, I wouldn't have thought straight straight out of like uh, twenty twenty at the end of twenty twenty two that uh, Llama, for example, that Facebook would come with, with with such a good model just a few months after. It feels like feels like they all knew this was coming and they were ready. There's the, someone just needed, needed to take the first step and then all the others came with their own foundation models. But yeah, so I've been following that and I think there's many interesting things uh, with that. And it has, for example, the cost, which turns out to be uh, quite challenging when using OpenAI huge element uh, of it, uh, having the control uh, internally of the model yourself. 
yeah. uh, having being able to put your own guardrails around it to, to a larger degree. Yeah, and, and also to... running it on device, I think, is super interesting, which I've been, been, been yeah. checking out or experimenting with in the browser for, for one thing, much I'll just smaller jump in models. To add, one thing I'll just jump yeah. in to add, being able to add your own proprietary data to it without worrying about it leaking uh, and being extractable from, you know, GPT-4. Like, like you can kind of, like, get it, to, you can do tricks to get it to reveal its training data and stuff like that. And if you could do that, and your data that you've inputted into GPT-4 or GPT-5 or whatever, is part of the training data or, or that some of the information you've already used somehow made it into the next version, proprietary, you know, trade secrets could essentially be extracted that way. So it, it's a security yeah. consideration. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to derail, but... but no, no, but that's so, a so, great point. Like, so running on device, use, uh, yeah. your own data, your own guardrails, um, so many reasons why having your own model is potentially running on your own servers is superior in a lot of use cases and of course cost uh, because yep. gpt4 is, it's expensive to run a model that massive uh it occurred to me that a lot of people may not even know what some of these terms that we're using like foundation model mean so figured maybe we could do a quick uh question and answer session where you could quickly define some of these terms that people are likely hearing when they hear about ai engineering let's start with foundation model yeah so so that's the kind of uh models that can do not one thing, not one narrow use case, but they are kind of foundational. They have some kind of generalized intelligence, I would say. And they can do language, they can talk as a human, they can do generate code, they can, they are multimodal much of the time, or many times multimodals, they can deal with images and stuff like that. So kind of more general, not the, the old kind of narrow classification AI that can j just spot the cat in an image and just do that. No, a foundation model can do uh, many different things. Okay, and what is embedding? Yeah, so an embedding is, it, it's, I think it's a ma mathematical expression, which um, means to take one object and put it into a new space just a bit abstract, but um, essentially what it means is that you take, for example, one object, a paragraph about uh, dogs, for example, and you turn that into, uh, uh, you transform that into just a long array of uh, numbers, of floating point numbers. And those numbers then are a representation of the underlying meaning of that sentence. They are an embedding of that paragraph, uh, but they are of course in a different space since they're now numbers and not like text. Yeah, so that they can essentially play a part in, I guess, the weightings and how the neural network decides what output to get. Um, and yeah, because then, then you. Oh, yeah. go ahead. No, because uh, then you can actually. It's quite cool to see see visualizations of this, which we have in our our embeddings course. Uh, where you kind of see that it's very easy. Once you have something in an array of numbers, it's very easy to mathematically compare the two and the distance between the two. So that's how the AI can know that once it has two array, two embeddings, one of a dog and one of cat and one of Saturn, it'll, it'll see that mathematically dog and cat are closer to each other than Saturn and know that, oh, these two things make, are somewhat semantically connected. And what is R A G RAG, as some as people sometimes refer to it? it yeah. Quickly. So it's one of these uh, three letter acronyms that scare beginners off, but aren't really that complex. I feel like developers sometimes like try to come up with with, with three letter acronyms that are uh, just to make it hard for people to kind of uh, to, to understand yeah, what they're doing. It's not but just it developers. The government loves to come up with three letter acronyms in the military, and yeah. Maybe maybe it's a human thing to the kind of uh, define the in crowd and the out crowd. Anyway, yeah. okay, I'll, I'll get to the point. So, um, rag uh, retrieval augmented generation. Imagine that you have a company uh, and uh, you have a bunch of internal data that, and you want to create a knowledge bank where where employees can ask, for example, like, uh, what's the vacation policy or refund policy for receipts and blah blah blah. That that's obviously data that don't live in ChatGPT's uh, model or li live in their model. It's data that lives in a vector, 
that lives um, when you use RAG in a vector database in the form of embeddings. Mm -hmm. So uh, RAG means that you, when you ask the question about what's our vacation policy like, the app heads over to a vector database and figures out through your your question and the embeddings that are there and the mat mathematical calculations for, for for calculating distance between embeddings it f it manages to find the uh, the information it needs uh, to reply to your question with the the kind of uh, close data that you have in your company uh, and and then you then you use ChatGPT to uh, or or whatever AI API or whatever foundation model you use to to turn that into more of a conversational reply with the the, the data that you fetched via the like the the, the RAG um, approach. If that yeah, made so, sense. So RAG is essentially a way that you can uh, take your own data and get it uh, where it can easily quickly interface, as opposed to I mean GPT four for example can now go. And searching with Bing, and it yeah. can pull stuff up too. Like if I ask, like, "What's the vacation policy of Free Code Camp?" Uh, or something like that, and, uh, then it could potentially scour the web and find that particular thing. But it's so much faster if you've got retrieval augmented generation, right? Yeah, um, rag. So it's just one of those things that speeds things up and and ultimately reduces cost. Because one thing that people may not realize when they're using ChatGPT is Every single query costs like I don't know, like twenty cents or something. It's it adds up very quickly. Wow. Like just yeah. sitting there talking about like He Man or something, or, or like the Doom Eternal like lore or something like that, which I was I was talking with it about yesterday. Like that, I I cost OpenAI probably like four or five bucks for my <laughs> discussion there, right? And that's why they're taking so much money because it's very expensive. But RG offers a way to potentially dramatically reduce costs. Um, when you're yeah, and also uh, less hallucination uh, as you kind of uh, as it's yeah. able to get the the right data uh, in the prompt, like so, so the result from 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 querying the vector databases so then used in the prompt, so to make the prompt more uh, specific and um, yeah, yeah. So I mean, you mentioned the term hallucination, which is a fun way to come for like essentially returning misinformation. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, models hallucinated all the time early on uh and it, yeah like gpt4 has gotten way better about that by the way like and, and it may not just be that gpt4 has gotten better but also subconsciously like i might just say oh i think that's wrong like i doubt it mm. more so like as people use these models they're going to become more uh skeptical and they're going to give it her intuition for like okay does it really know what it's talking about or is it just is it just uh you know, spitballing here, you know? Uh, and yeah. so there are so many things you can do to reduce those hallucinations. And if you're talking about like a customer facing app, you don't want it to like hallucinate your price of some product or something like that, or that yeah. could potentially be very catastrophic. Uh, or you don't, you don't want it to like hallucinate like legally binding contracts or something like that. Right. Um, so yeah, that is something that, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about like AI engineering and like what it is that AI engineers seek to do because we already have, you know, chat GPT and, and we have the open AI API. Obviously using AI, APIs like that are part of the AI engineer role, but maybe you yep. can talk about like what the main work to be done, what the open roles are. Talk about the field of AI engineering and Maybe give people who are watching this, listening to this, a pitch for why they should consider becoming AI engineers if they're already working as a front-end developer or a full-stack developer. Yeah, so why should they? I think uh, economically, it's a good idea because there are just so many managers and uh, business owners out there today who feel that uh, the, the AI train is leaving the station and their company is not on it, but maybe their competitors are. So being a little bit cynical, using that uh, kind of uh, anxiety uh, that is in a lot of companies these days, with good reason, I would say, uh, it will definitely help your career if you're the kind of person that can step up and say, hey, actually, I, I know some really cool features and, and next generation things we can uh, build into our, or at least experiment with uh, in our product. 
by using this API because I know all about RAG, I know how to create an AI agent, I know the AI safety prompt injection uh, risks we need to think about, uh, and I know how to do open source models, for example. I mean, if you, if yeah. you can come with a pitch like that to your to your boss or to 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 a company you want to work for, I think it's it's definitely going to open doors. Uh, yeah, and it's it's what I would do when I uh, if I had been a beginner now, and actually it's also what I would do hadn't I been uh, running Scrimba. Uh, I would just probably spend all my time just experimenting with building new kinds of experiences. So so that's a fun part. I I think um, it's it's a lot of fun and uh, it's good for uh, good for your career. That's um, I yeah. think why why people should jump on it. So how would you recommend somebody who's interested in breaking into tech? Maybe they're learning to code. How would you recommend they start using AI? And how do they, what should they do to get on the fast track to understanding these tools and being able to leverage them? Yeah, obviously I got to plug our Scrimba AI engineering path. That, that'll kind of take you, take you on the fast lane. But uh, all that aside, assuming that you've actually uh, learned it one way or another, I think there's so many cool things you can do uh, to get attention these days and, and get get kind of a an edge on the rest of the um, on the rest of the market or the rest of the job seekers out there. What I would have done today, I would have actually found my ideal company that I wanted to work for, and then I would have uh, thought as an AI engineer, what does what what does the dream product or what's one one AI product that this company should have or that it will have in three years? Maybe it's you want to really want to work for for a biggest law firm in your uh, your town, right? Then then I would like okay, well, what's what's an, like law plus AI? There's just so many ideas, so many things you can do to help lawyers draft documents or read through uh, previous law uh, law documents about um, right. Yeah, about um, what's the word? Precedent. Uh, <laughs> uh, pre precedent. Yeah. yeah for example, like precedent. that, or for legal precedent. So many things that can be done. Uh, or, or marketing tools like quickly help you with your uh, your uh, problem uh, with your tax problem or just bot a bot for that whatever there's so many ways you can go to companies these days and say hey look at this prototype I've built it's you should really have such a tool in house how about yeah. you just hire me and I'll start building these kinds of things for you that so, that's how I would would try to get my foot in the door in the tech industry uh, today had I been a complete beginner. Wow. Okay. So just to, just to recapitulate what you just said, instead of applying, you know, through web forms or, or going to networking events, which you can do that too, but like to build a prototype specifically for the company and say, Hey, have you considered adding this to this product and using that as a way to potentially get hired on to build precisely that. So it's almost kind of like inventing your own job within that company yeah. and your own product. Uh, or extension of an existing product. Exactly. You could even, I mean, if you really want to uh, go, go, go the last mile, you deploy it with their design on a URL that resembles theirs and like just send it over to them as a fully branded product as well. And yeah, that, yeah. That, that, just don't try that with Nintendo. so many doors. Because <laughs> <laughs> in software, they created like a, a version of Mario that ran on uh, Windows or, or DOS, I guess. And, oh. and Nintendo was like, don't distribute this yeah. or we'll sue you. So it, it won't, it, it may backfire in some situations, but like if you're approaching <laughs> yeah. like probably a big American tech company, maybe they'll be more receptive. Sorry. I, I, I bet it help helped that. that person's career though that did it. I mean, they went on to create great things and it bolstered their reputation uh, for being the first, you know, company to essentially get side scrolling games working on DOS. So yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, it worked out fine for them, obviously. They're all who, who was it? Great. Did you say id Software, the the creators of Doom and oh you know, oh oh yeah Quake yeah all those games yeah but but originally I they were I, I read that book Mario Masters Pro. of Doom but uh, forgot Amazing about that book. chapter. Amazing yeah. book. So uh, it's been an amazing time talking with you. I've learned so much about AI engineering and where you think things are heading. We've also heard a whole lot of practical tips for how you can incorporate AI into your daily workflow and potentially learn these tools and go out and create a role for yourself at your dream company. So uh, 
Per, I just want to thank you again for coming on the Free Code Camp podcast. It's been a pleasure, man. Likewise. And uh, thank you so much for, for having me and for being a Scrimba supporter ever since uh, day one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, I just, I love the invention, the discovery that is uh, <laughs> Scrimba. So it's, it's been amazing to follow your journey over the years and uh, excited to talk with you again in the future. Um, everybody. Likewise. Watching this. Until next week, happy coding. Happy coding.